All right, welcome everyone back to another episode of CRNA School Prep Academy. I'm your host, Jenny Fennell, CRNA, and I today have a very special guest, Matt Zinder. He's here with me today. Welcome, Matt. Thank you very much for having me, Jenny. Yeah, and so you guys, Matt, I'm so excited about having him here because he has been someone who's been in my world now for quite some time, for about, a, oh, probably going almost a year now, which is kind of hard to believe, but I know I stumbled upon your um, your involvement in the AANA, and I kind of got tuned in with how he helps students um, cope with stress during school. Um, Matt has kind of a very extensive background in doing the, that exact thing, and he's very passionate about helping students find success in their programs. Um, he has a very long um, length of a um, of kind of accomplishments, and um, I'd probably be doing him a disservice if I kind of discuss all of them. So I'm going to let him kind of introduce himself and kind of what he's all about um, and his time as a faculty member and um, his own anesthesia practice. So go ahead, take it away, Matt. Well, thanks again, Jenny. I, I really do appreciate you having me on. Uh, and I, the list is not that long, but uh, oh, I, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that uh, for the last 15 years of my anesthesia career, I've been a I've been a CRNA for 18 years. And for the last 15 years, I have owned and operated a mobile anesthesia practice in Maryland, where we cover all ambulatory surgery centers throughout the entire state. Uh, and we've been around for 37 years. My father actually started the practice in 1984. And ever since then, uh, that has always been, of course, my primary, uh, um, my primary career. But probably in the last 12 or 13 years, I've also gotten into speaking and education. And so I've been on the uh, national lecture circuit for about 12 or 13 years. And with that, I then started to get more into the realm of health and wellness for healthcare providers, uh, especially with the entire COVID experience. I think it drives home uh, the fact that we need to really start paying attention to taking care of ourselves which is it's literally in our education and in our culture that we only should take care of others and not ourselves. So I'm working very hard to change that culture. Uh, and I've actually been speaking on health and wellness for a good five or six years. And oddly enough, I, I over those years had gotten a lot of resistance to delivering a lot of those talks. And luckily, if, if anything good could come from COVID, uh, that's the opposite now. I think I'm getting a lot of interest with those, with that topic and, 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 uh, and those talks. And then since then, I also have then gotten into what you had already mentioned, and that is working with university students and their health and wellness and their stress management, because obviously anyone who goes through a three-year or more intense program, uh, and then it all comes down to one day, if they are normal human beings, they're going to exhibit symptoms of extreme stress that day. Uh, and many of our clients just get in the way of themselves. They know the information, they can pass their boards, but they are so anxious, understandably, that uh, they have a hard time being uh, successful. So uh, I, with uh, Dr. Peter Struby, uh, are part of a program where we work one-on-one -on -one with uh, university students. Uh, in, in that regard. He works with the academic side, didactic side, and I work to teach them stress management techniques. Uh, and then on the other, you know, a couple other things, uh, I, I have a national symposium uh, called the uh, Provider Wellness Symposium. Uh, again, along that, that line or uh, in that theme, where we are again, working to teach healthcare providers to take care of themselves, not just others. So that is in, that's actually this year in Austin, uh, in November 5th to the 7th, uh, and we're hoping that that will be a, a great success, uh, trying to get some people out to, uh, to understand and to, uh, to learn some techniques for uh, self-care, uh, but, uh, but that's about it. Yeah, no, that, <laughs> that's, that's a lot. I feel like that's a lot. Yeah, yeah that symposium is going to be awesome, and I know Austin's a great town to visit. Um, it's like the music town and um, just a lot of fun restaurants and definitely a place to check out. So it'd be, I'm, that's exciting that you picked a fun location to have a wellness symposium at. Um, yeah, we're really looking forward to it. I mean, I have a production manager. He's a, a very good friend of mine. And uh, he actually, as an aside, he has his own international conference of, in a different field. Mm -hmm. uh, and this facility or this location in Austin is his favorite in the entire United States. So we were like, well, that's, yeah. that's good enough for us. And yeah. it is actually a really great venue for what we're doing. It's 
it's all about wellness. The grounds are, I mean, you could literally take a walk and feel renewed. So it's that great of a, yeah. of a facility. So we're looking. I forward. actually did check it out. It looks awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like a retreat. Yeah. Lost That's Pines it. Resort is what yeah. it's called. Yeah. yeah. Well, very good. You guys check it out. You said November 7th. It's November 5th to the 7th of this year. Yep. We 7th. hope to make it every year. Every year. Awesome. Yeah. So definitely you guys. Um, and I think you, like you said, it's, People neglect this aspect, but it's the very same thing that people are neglecting that kind of leads into problems within our field, such as potential alcohol abuse or drug abuse or burnout. Um, and I can't tell you how many students I routinely work with who say one of the biggest things they struggle with is managing their stress. And to the point where it's almost cracked a few of them to where they've been put on kind of like a, a disciplinary action in their program. And if it were for better stressing cope, cope and coping techniques, they'd actually wouldn't um, be in this predicament essentially. And I think a lot of people don't understand what they need until it's too late. And so they enter these programs thinking that they got it, you know, which I always encourage positivity, but, you know, I really think you need to be thinking about how am I going to handle it when I'm like reached my breaking point of stress, what am I going to do, you know, and, and working on ways to combat that before school even starts. Um, so you guys too, one more quick thing I wanna make an announcement too is um, that Matt actually has agreed to speak at our conference this fall as well. And so um, I'm excited to share this episode with you today too, cause you can kind of get a feel for how Matt can really bring some clarity into your life um, through his teachings. Um, and same thing with his symposium that's gonna be happening this November. Um, so again, that's kind of why I'm excited to bring to you guys this episode. So you guys can kind of get a little taste what you're in store for some good stuff. Um, but kind of one of the first questions I kind of want to address or have you address uh, for the audience is why stress management is so important in school. Well, I, I mean, I, it really doesn't matter what you're studying. School is stressful and it's intense and you have to perform and you have to you have to spend most of your free time preparing uh, to to give them what they're asking for in exchange for successfully finishing. And no matter what that field is, it's intense. Now carry that over into healthcare and you can multiply that by a hundred as far as intensity is concerned, because not only are you now being just inundated with a huge amount of information, now you have to actually go to a clinical setting and, and, and perform that duty. Uh, along with thinking and, and regurgitating textbook information and then applying it to real world. And, and oh, by the way, we just happen to be in a profession that uh, quite literally brings a person to the edge of death. And we have to keep them there and then we have to bring them back at will. Uh, that's stressful. So it is incredibly it, important for us to change the culture of education and healthcare and teach self-care as well. Because I've said this so many times, but if you are not engaging in self-care as a student, resident, and then a provider, then eventually you're going to become someone that someone else has to take care of. Uh, and and I, I, always, I tell this story a lot too, where uh, my, uh, healthcare or my, my healthcare career started with EMS, uh, as I started as an EMT in a, a volunteer fire station. And that's really what pushed me into being interested in healthcare, because I actually started college uh, training to be a photojournalist. So going from arts to sciences was uh, quite a culture shock, but it was EMS that really pushed me into a high level of interest. And I'll never forget, and this was 25 years ago, uh, I'll never forget the first day of training to be an EMT. The very first thing that the instructor talked about was this concept of scene safety. Now, if anybody out there is an EMS, they know exactly what I'm talking about. But the concept of scene safety is when you roll up onto a scene, the first thing that you do is assess that scene for your personal safety before you enter it to rescue anyone else. Because if you don't do that, then if you enter that scene, you may now have just created two people to rescue instead of just one. So I carry that concept into what I'm talking about now. And that is if we do not take care of ourselves as healthcare providers first, then we'll eventually become someone else, someone else's um, care. So, or go into someone else's care. So it, it's very important. 
So it's almost this concept of uh, the virtue of selfishness in healthcare. We have to think of ourselves first and our wellness, because if we are unhealthy, then we, were n we will not be effective healthcare providers. So Carrie, to go back to your question, it starts in education because we are literally taught in our educational programs that we should not take care of ourselves. We should push it, we should grind, we should not be sleeping, we should be pulling all nighters. Uh, I mean, I've had, I've had, I mean, I have a whole book of notes full of different clients telling me of their stories and what their clinical instructors are telling them on how to take care of themselves. And it's, you're not supposed to sleep. You're supposed to be studying. You're supposed to be doing this, that. And it's just incredible to me because mm -hmm. uh, even to the point where, you know, some clinical instructors will say, I had a horrible experience and you should do, you know, those types of things. We really do need to change the culture. And the more that we do that and the more that we work on it, I think the more success we'll see in our students. Yeah, I 100% agree. And yeah, you're right. There are a lot of those things going on uh, where students are, even if they don't want to feel like they're pushed up against the wall, they're kind of forced into pushing through a lot of this burnout, pushing through a lot of this stress. And I remember really clearly feeling like I always felt like I had a huge weight on my shoulders. Like I just felt like I was carrying the world and that was during school. And I just felt like I, I couldn't, breathe hard like i've almost felt like i couldn't catch my breath because it was like so heavy um of a feeling of like like you said kind of always being on your a game and and um just gosh forbid you had you know an off day or something and you know always feeling like you have to do more you have to do more like you're not doing enough and um i even experienced that as a crna when and don't get me wrong maybe this is a perspective from a, a woman's perspective but i'm sure it covers a lot of people but especially having kids i was under a lot of pressure from people to feel like i needed to keep doing you know call and all this overtime and 24 hour shifts and yada 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 and i remember feeling kind of like i just it, it made me feel uncomfortable in a way that i'm like why should i have to why shouldn't have to i shouldn't have to give you reasons i should just be able to make my choice and you should be happy for that and not i don't need to give you an excuse or a reason why i don't want to work those kind of hours and um, doesn't make me a bad practitioner. Doesn't make me a less of a CRNA. Um, I'm still there for my patients. I still show up and do my my job well. So why do I have to kill myself and work 60 hours a week? And it is like you said, kind of an inbred um, in our system. Um, I do think it's changing. I do think that, like you said, as long as we keep making strides to kind of change the culture, it's going to become less. Hopefully, it's going to become less common. Um, but I always kind of believe, like even like you said, how people are like, well, I always had a miserable experience, so you have to have a miserable experience, and that's kind of the same thing with like inbred bullying where like you were bullied. So you feel like, and I, I can't stand that. Like it drives me up the wall, but I really hope, and that you would think that if you were bullied or if you were told that you would actually want to do the opposite, but it must just be enough for some people to flip a switch in their brain where they're like, this is the standard, this is the norm, and this is the expectation. And if they don't meet that expectation, I'm going to let them know that's really unfortunate. And so I encourage you, if you're listening to this and you're a student, know that if you are having a hard time in school, if you are experiencing what I kind of call like inbreeding bullying and pressure to do more, to keep, you know, never sleep, to always work um, and stuff like that, to know that that's, don't let that be your practice. Don't let, don't let you ever do that to another student. If you don't like the way it feels currently as a student, then make a point to know that you're not going to be like that when you're a CRNA to your student. Um, yeah, it's really, and you know, a lot of our behavior is how we were raised, right? And that that also carries into our intense experiences in our lives. So if you go through a, an intense educational experience, then you're you're brought up to believe that that's how it works in education, in your training. And then if you ever get to the point where you are then going to be precepting students yourself, you may still think that that is the way to go. Uh, and, and not to say that it shouldn't be intense, uh, students have to be properly prepared because it's just an intense profession that, that we've all chosen. But as an aside, because it's so intense, we need to make sure that, that these people are taking care of themselves as well. Right. And I even think it goes as simple as like asking your student, how are you doing? And I remember, um, there were students that I used to work with who I could tell when they were having something going on in their life. And I could just see it. Like, it's like that dullness in their eyes where you could tell they're mentally checked out and just asking them like, Hey, are you doing okay? Is something going on? And nine times out of 10, they would love to share Like they always shared with me what was going on. Cause they were excited that I even asked, like I actually cared. Um, and if they needed a break to step out to the bathroom to cry it out, that's what we did, you know? And, 
Um, I think I encourage people to have that compassion for their students because life still happens. They could have just lost their grandma or their dog could be sick or, you know, maybe they are on the borderline of being on academic probation in school and they're just there, or maybe they've had a preceptor that, the previous day yell at them for something that is probably pretty minuscule in the big scheme of things, but now they feel like a failure. And so they're coming, they're having a hard time showing up the next day for you. Um, Cause they feel like they need to perform, you know, they, they don't have that confidence. So asking your student how they're doing and letting them share their thoughts and their fears. Um, you know, so I think that's important too, as a preceptor to be that way for your students, to let them know that, Hey, I'm a safe person you can talk to. And guess what? I was there one time too. I struggled the same way that you're struggling right now. So let me know what's going on. Um, and that way you can hopefully give them more grace if they need it. Um, you know, but like you said, just in general, the environment is already stressful. If they're learning a brand new task and skill set they've never done before, it's intimidating. Even with experience, it's intimidating. Um, I was just sharing in my last episode that I'm going back after being off for three months. And every time like I've had three kids, you would think by now, like, I would be used to this feeling of going back to work. I'm still scared to mm-hmm. go back to work after being off for three months. I'm like, I hope I don't forget. <laughs> and it, cause it's going back to that really intense environment. And so as a student, it's intense every day because again, it's all so new. Um, but just so you guys know, humanize this, that even experienced CRNAs still feel intimidated by their work environment sometimes because it is a very intense atmosphere in general. Um, would you say that um, you see students struggle, or I should say, what should you, what do you see students struggle with the most um, as far as managing stress goes? I think just probably knowing how to deal with it. Uh, a lot of it is time management. Uh, we, we just recently worked with a particular program where uh, they brought us in to preemptively work with the students even before they graduate and get to the boards. Uh, and it was for really preparing for the C exam. And most, the, the main theme that I got from speaking to each one of these students, because again, our program is one-on-one, uh, was time management and dealing with the boatload of of information and assignments and everything that has to be done, including showing up for clinicals and being competent and safe and knowing what is happening and and having studied and being prepared for that. So it's a lot. Uh, and, And I think on the other side, really just knowing what to do and how to do it. Uh, and, and like, let's say for a person, for example, if a person has test anxiety, and they're just sitting down and they're just not able to think, what can you do about that? So that's kind of what I do is I, I discuss really specifically doing three different stress management techniques that I recommend on a daily basis to each one of them. And then after that, and I give them all kinds of resources. And then after that, we uh, both, uh, Dr. Struby and I are available one-on-one for updates and tweaking things and ask, answering questions and things like that. Uh, but really it's the, fa- it's, it's the lack of knowledge on what to do when a person sits down or is at the head of the bed and is, or sits down to a test, has test anxiety, or is at the head of the bed to deal with a difficult airway or a difficult preceptor, one or the other, uh, or a difficult patient and what to do about those feelings of acute stress what to do preemptively, what to do in the moment, what to do afterwards. It's just really uh, 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 an educational, an an additional educational thing. So, and I've had scores of students say that that they'll do these techniques for the rest of their life, even after passing the boards or or whatever stage they were in. Mm -hmm. And and really, all humans should be practicing some level of stress management activity or stress or, or uh, technique because uh, it really is incredibly healthy activities. Mm-hmm. And this kind of include like mindset kind of thing, would you say like kind of like getting yourself well, in the right mindset? I can tell you, I mean, the three things that I teach uh, on you know, what we call our intake call. So the first time I get on the phone with somebody, in fact, I have four students pending right now that I'll be getting on the phone with uh, starting probably today. So I uh, spend a little less than an hour on that first phone call and I find out what's going on with them and then and what they're interested in, in talking about because I don't, 
first of all, right out of the, right out of the gate, I don't push this on anyone mm -hmm. because you, you, where you can mandate academic information and you can mandate assignments and, and any of the information necessary for graduation and, and competent uh, pra you know, practice, uh, you can't mandate stress management activities because if you, if you forced a person to do them, they won't work for them if they didn't want to do them in the first place. Becomes so stressful. people, yeah, people have to want this. Uh, but for those who are interested, uh, I teach mindfulness meditation, uh, breathing exercises, and we talk about uh, hypnosis and hypnotherapy. So I'm, I'm also a hypnotherapist. So what I do is I give them two of my guided hypnosis sessions. Uh, so two of my audio recordings. So you hear my voice on them. And so between the three of those, I recommend all three on a daily basis. And uh, the meditation works on the conscious level, just consciously quieting your mind, giving your brain a reset. The breathing exercises are incredibly effective for acute stress. You don't have to be in any other state, calm or anything. You can just be, you can be driving, you can be sitting down to a test or you can be standing at the head of the bed. Uh, and then the hypnosis is kind of dealing with that deeper subconscious, changing the hard wiring. So I kind of hit them on all cylinders. And between the, I think, I think we're in, since we've started this program, the one-on-one -on -one tutoring program, I think we're up to about uh, 275 students and many, we have just great success. I mean, people have passed the boards after having been unsuccessful three, four, five, six, seven times. And it's all, it's generally because of the anxiety getting in the way. Yeah. Um, but then after that, I do get further into it with them if they want to ask more questions, if they're dealing with further things like negative self-talk, there's some, some uh, techniques for dealing with that negative voice in your head and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, and there have been times when we have referred them to, uh, to therapy which uh, is incredibly effective and evidence-based, and I'll never understand the stigma that is attached to it. Um, but um, because what I do is not therapy, I'm not a therapist. I want to be clear on that. I, I basically, I'm, I, I teach techniques. Mm -hmm. I'm more of a consultant. And then uh, following that, if it needs to go to another level, we do refer out. But generally it really is the techniques. You know, the techniques are so effective and these practices, again, I, I think all human beings every single day should, should meditate. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is that effective for, for grounding a person, making sense of things. Uh, it, there are so many benefits and it's in the research. You can look it up in New England Journal, Pain, JAMA, AANA Journal, and you will find scores of research that backs efficacy. Mm -hmm. No, so 100%. It, they're great. They're, they're great techniques. And, and again, back to your earlier question, it really is almost just a lack of knowledge for many people. And once they learn that there are things and techniques out there that, that, that they can do and they start to actually uh, do them, then they're, a lot of them are shocked at how effective they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love all of this. This is so great. And because like you said, the time management piece, if that's not well, that causes the stress. And so then it kind of, and it just kind of festers in this big, ugly circle. Um, but I love that you teach mindful, you know, kind of like, uh, mindfulness and then the breathing techniques. Um, I am for one, a believer in meditation. Um, and I was definitely a, a skeptic at one point in my life. Um, and I dealt with a lot of anxiety. I still actually do. I mean, you always do. I think if you have that piece to your yourself, it's always going to be there, but it's a matter of like, kind of how can you work with it to not have it affect you physically and mentally? Um, but it was so, so bad to where when I was in school, I was getting panic attacks and that this was happening in like every single week. Um, to the point where I knew what they were, so I wouldn't freak out about them, but I just, it's kind of stinks to feel like you can't breathe for a while. Um, and I'll tell you guys right now that like when I was in school, if I would have had something like what you had to offer, um, heck yeah, that would have been amazing. Like that would have saved me. I graduated with stomach ulcers. I graduated with like, um, oh, insomnia. Um, I mean, I had, I was starting, I was losing hair. Like, I mean, I wish I was losing hair on my legs, but I was like losing hair on my head, <laughs> you know, like, and I, it was just the over extreme stress response over a period of years. And I was in a really unhealthy place physically when I graduated. Um, and I used to think like, okay, I need long-term like proton pump inhibitors. Like, cause I, I was, my stomach was a mess. Um, but what's funny is as soon as I passed boards within about a few months, my heartburn went away. I grew back my hair. 
I could sleep again, which I thought I was just cursed because I went from being a night shift nurse thinking, okay, it's night shift screwing me up to grad school. And that really, I was, I was trying like Lunesta, Ambien, Benadryl, nothing. And Ambien mean don't mix (laughs) I found out Mm -hmm. too. So like I was doing all these unhealthy things, like pumping my body full of more medication and drinking lots of alcohol and like just probably the typical things that students do because they don't know how to cope with stress when again, your program offers a solution that's healthy and something they can work with the rest of their lives. So I'll tell you right now, now that I'm like 10 years older, wiser, I have learned how to meditate and it has helped me tremendously like with my pregnancies because I've had anxiety with high blood pressure. So again, now that I can meditate, my blood pressure is not high. And I use that in the OR when I get in that, I feel that my, that test, that chest tightening come on. Like you said, if you're getting ready to do a difficult airway and you're nervous, you can do these breathing exercises, no matter where you are, once you get good at them, it's more about persistence and learning what works and how slow you have to breathe and how, how, like the, the pace of it is kind of what you have to learn. Um, but this, you guys, this stuff, I hope you're enjoying this. This is like gold. Um, and so, so invaluable. And again, this is going to help you not only as an SRNA, but the rest of your life. So, um, what you do for students is life-changing. So thank you. (laughs) Oh, well, thank you. I mean, and, and the, the, the sad thing here is what you described in your experience is more common than it should be. Mm-hmm. And it, and that is, that is the problem. We are graduating people out of university programs more unhealthy physically than when they started the program. And here they're healthcare providers. It is, it is a ridiculous hypocrisy. And I think, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm really, you know, it's funny. I keep mentioning this in many different venues. I'm actually writing a book on the subject, but books are a big nut to crack and I'm having trouble with my own time management uh, because what I'd really love to do is take a few months off completely and literally just write a book, but uh, I have begun it uh, and uh, it is on the subject. It is just, it's an examination of, of the culture of poor self-care and healthcare providers. And of course, you know, I throw in a bunch of uh techniques to manage and and counteract and and get healthier uh probably the second half of the book but it um i think it's a great need for us to really change the culture of our education and make sure that that we are effective healthcare providers because if we're not healthy we're not going to be effective Uh, i mean there are some programs that now and this is not everyone but there unfortunately are some programs out there creating PTSD in individuals mm. because of, because one of the criteria, it's one of my talks is PTSD and healthcare providers. One of the talk or one of the criteria for diagnosis of PTSD is, is exposure to long-term chronic stress. And I, we, we've dealt with some clients that are literally, and those are some of the ones that we have elevated into uh, referring to therapy that literally have PTSD from their programs whether it be from, you know, verbal abuse or, uh, you know, being taught not to take care of themselves, things like that. So it, it can be that serious. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one, and of course, you know, one of the criteria for PTSD and healthcare providers anyway, is of course also dealing with the, you know, a critical incident, but then that's where that first, second victim scenario comes in that a lot of articles are written about and a lot of research so that first second victim is the first victim is that patient, unfortunately, that had the critical incident. The second victim is the healthcare provider that took care of that, that, that patient. But there was a, an article that I use in my talk that actually talks about the first, second, second and third victim. So again, the first victim is that patient, unfortunately, that dealt with the, or that had the critical incident. The second victim is the healthcare provider. The third victim is that healthcare provider's next patient because they're no longer the same healthcare mm-hmm. provider. So you can carry that concept into long-term chronic stress as well. Are you a healthy individual or healthy enough to be an effective healthcare provider? Mm-hmm. It's a question to ask oneself. Yeah, no, that's so good. And it's kind of scary now that I'm like thinking about all that. I'm like, holy moly, like it's a huge can of worms like you're talking about. <laughs> and I can think of so many people that I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I do have one request. When you get this book done, can you make an odd, <laughs> can you put it on audio, please? <laughs> so I can listen to it because I want to buy it. <laughs> I would be happy to do it on audio. I, I, I have to get, my biggest thing is uh, when it comes to getting a book published is you got to go through that whole 
other world of yeah. getting the agent and the publishing house to be <sighs> interested in in answering the phone when you call and mm -hmm. so it's um it, it's a it's again it's a it's a whole nother world that i hope that i'll I hope to be able to uh, navigate because yeah. I personally am biased, but I personally think it's a very important subject. Mm -hmm. No, hundred percent for sure. It's important. And again, like I said, it's kind of, it's a neglected subject and I, there probably is some kind of stigmatism to it. Um, unfortunately, I think everyone just sees it. Maybe if I admit to this, maybe I'm weak or maybe I'm not qualified for this and they kind of see it that way. So they just don't want to talk about it, but then it affects them clearly at home. They're miserable. Their spouse notices their kids notice they drink too much, you know? So it, it really kind of spirals behind the scenes on behind closed doors and then it only manifests and publicly when it's become a big festering problem. Um, and so it's really, like you said, important to really deal with this now because everyone needs this. Anyone who says they don't need it is just straight up lying. Yeah. <laughs> um, cause or it's so important. We're all human. Yeah. What's that? Or they're following the culture. You know, it's yeah. how they've been brought up to think they, they're, they have been, we, we literally teach not to take care of yourself. You're only supposed to take care of others. And it just, mm -hmm. It's it. I think we would have a much healthier and more effective healthcare provider population if we did the opposite. Yeah. No, I hundred percent agree. Um, so I guess if I were to ask you, if if students could just do pick one of those things to do prior to school starting, what do you think is like the most important aspect um, for them to start doing before they actually start school? If they had to do one thing. You mean one of those techniques? Yeah. If they had to pick one to work on. Um, well, I, it, it, I would say meditation is just so incredibly effective and incredibly healthy. Uh, but at the risk of not truly answering your question, I'm going to add, I'm going to say two out of the three. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I would also recommend the breathing exercises because breathing is so incredibly effective and, and healthy in your everyday life. Uh, mm -hmm. If you literally just stop for a moment and pay attention to your breathing, then by the way, you're meditating. I was going to say, that's what I always thought too. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and you can do things such, I mean, you can do such easy things. I learned this from my business partner uh, with the symposium. Uh, his name's Rodrigo Garcia. Uh, he, he actually owns and operates, uh, or he's the CEO of a treatment center for healthcare providers that are dealing with substance use disorder. And one of his therapists that works for him uh, came up with this idea where every time he's at a stoplight, he counts his breaths to see how many breaths he'll he'll have until it turns green again. And for and first of all, that means he's doing a breathing exercise, which calms you down. He's meditating because he's paying attention to the present moment, and he's no longer annoyed by how long that light is lasting. <laughs> and there are such easy techniques like that that literally are so incredibly effective for a healthier mindset set and, and just general wellness. I mean, again, meditation has been shown in the research to literally increase the gray matter in your brain in areas of compassion and positivity. They lit it literally can change the structure of your brain for the positive. Mm -hmm. Whereas chronic stress does the opposite. They show literal structural changes to your brain toward the negative like decreased blood flow and shrinking gray matter and i mean it really is that serious mm -hmm. and not to mention all the other systems that that are affected by long-term chronic stress so um i would say both really to to really look at um there's a lot of lot of literature now on uh, breath work mm -hmm. and different breathing exercises from the type of breathing exercises that will calm you down, keep you calm, uh, relax you to the opposite, like Wim Hof method, which is the concept of hormetic stress, which is intentionally placing yourself into the sympathetic response, which actually allows your body to get the short-term benefits of stress, but then bring yourself easier back down to parasympathetic. So there, there's so many benefits uh, to, to practicing those different techniques. Yeah, no, and obviously there's a lot more to it too. There's a bunch of different techniques, like you said, to actually get the desired effect from it. Um, one thing um, I know that I that you I had seen through some of the avenues that you had posted about was this little um, device. You'll probably have to remember the name of it because I already forget, but it's essentially a breathing device. Yeah, um, but it's I love this device in its simplicity. 
and that it's called the switch. Now, the reason it's called the switch is because it switches you from sympathetic to parasympathetic. Oh. And it literally is just a little tube. It's mm -hmm. about maybe two inches in length, maybe maybe an inch and a half. Mm -hmm. It's a little metal tube. It's very, uh, it's made very, uh, it's, an, it's attractive. So they kind of bill it as a piece of jewelry. Mm -hmm. They sell it with a chain to wear around your neck. <laughs> But literally, it just assists with breathing exercises. So what you do is uh, um, when you take when you do a breathing exercise, let's say one where you take a big deep breath in through your nose, what you want to do is you want to make your out breath longer than your in breath. Okay, mm -hmm. because actually, if you can uh, um, change the the chemistry of your body, meaning, you know, your your uh, acid base balance, you know, the 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 level of CO2 in your body, it actually will uh, facilitate uptake, more uptake of oxygen into your cells. So it actually, that's one of the reasons you feel really good when you're doing one of these breathing exercises, because uh, it's a chemical change. So what this tube or little straw does is you take a good deep breath into your nose and you put this in your mouth and you let the breath release through the straw. You don't blow through it. You literally just let it release through the straw and it creates a seven second exhalation in an adult. And if you do that breathing exercise literally like two or three times, when you're done, you feel a complete release of tension. You feel mm -hmm. completely relaxed. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean, if I, I've actually been in touch with the uh, the owner and the inventor of that, and uh, he gave me actually a a discount code if you want to put that in the show yeah. notes. Yeah, uh, definitely. I'll link to that because you guys, that little device is actually what helped me when I was learning. Because it, what I struggled with was learning the timing of it, and that makes it so easy. <laughs> yes, right. Um, because a lot so, of people have a hard time with the out breath. Uh -huh. You can do a breathing exercise, but they have a hard time extending that out yes. breath, even to the point where, like, when if you're not using the device. Now, the device makes it very easy, but if you're not using the device and you feel like your out breath is finished, keep going and push. Hmm. Deep, once you get to the point of where it's no longer naturally releasing, push for a couple more seconds. So I teach box breathing. Mm -hmm. So box breathing is in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four. It's something that the military teaches. Hmm. I change it though. I say in for four, hold for four, out for seven, hold for four. Hmm. Okay. And even if you get to four and, and you don't have anything left, push for another three seconds. Because again, you really want that out breath to be longer. And this device really makes that very, very easy. Yeah, no, it's really cool. I'll definitely link to it in case you guys want to practice. This is what helped me. Um, Cause even when you, when you get used to using it on a daily basis, when you don't have it, I don't always wear mine around my neck. Cause I feel kind of, kind of cheesy doing it, but um, it in helps me <laughs> know that what I, what I to expect when I do it on my own. Um, and it was actually kind of nice wearing masks around town because I never really worried about people seeing me pursing my lips, <laughs> practicing my breathing. But I do it routinely, like when I'm in the car, if I'm waiting for the doctor to come in the doctor's office, I'll practice the breathing technique. Um, so it's it's been incredible what it's done. At least I can speak for myself who I've battled high blood pressure with anxiety, tachycardia, all that stuff. Um, I don't have that if I practice the breathing technique. So um, I encourage you guys that what uh, Matt is sharing with you is so, so important for you to do and practice prior to starting school. So I think we've shared a lot of great information today. Um, I kind of just want to sum this up with, um, you know, maybe some uh, big takeaway. If you could give um, any students like one big piece of advice, um, whether they're currently in school, maybe they're experiencing these, uh, what we're talking about, this uh, immense amount of pressure and burden of stress, like what's like a, what's something you can kind of give them to, give them some encouragement um, to go forward? Well, uh, I, I would say that the, the expect intensity, especially for the people that are about to go into a program, expect it to be intense. Don't let that catch you off guard because it will be intense. Uh, if it's a good program, it should be intense because you are going to be taking on an incredible amount of responsibility as the function of your profession. But also the big takeaway here, I hope, is to not forget about self-care, especially because of what you're about to go through. It, I don't care if you feel like you have no time whatsoever. There's always time to take care of yourself. I don't care what anyone is telling you. It's not anyone's right to tell you that you're not allowed to engage in self-care. Uh, I don't care what level they are at, in this program. Uh, you, so that means you need to sleep. It means you need to exercise, whatever that might be, whether it's a treadmill or a walk. You need to move your body. You need to get outside. You need to eat right. 
And I know this is all cliche, but unfortunately, even though it's cliche, nine times out of 10, people aren't doing it. Mm -hmm. That's why we have a pretty unhealthy population in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and we all know what to do. We just actually need to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also take the extra step and practice these other stress management techniques. And it can be, there's a whole list that doesn't have to just be what I'm telling you or what I teach. Uh, read up a little bit on it. There's scores of research, there's scores of literature. Uh, if anybody is a reader and wants to read up on, on meditation, a very simple book uh, is called 10% Happier. It's written by Dan Harris. Uh, he's an ABC News correspondent and uh, he went at it as a fidgety skeptic. That's, what, that's how he describes himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, he's skeptical of the entire self-help revolution, but yet now he has an entire company called 10% Happier that teaches meditation. So uh, that's a good book to get an introduction to it. Uh, another great book for breath work is called Breath by James Nestor. Fascinating book. He's also going to be the, the keynote speaker at the symposium. Mm -hmm. uh, and then another book by Dan Brule, it's just called Breath Work. Uh, so between those two, that would be a really good introduction on some other techniques that you could get into. And we're talking minutes a day here, by the way. I'm not talking about getting onto a treadmill for an hour and running as fast as you can until you reach total exhaustion. Uh, what I'm talking about is with, with mindfulness meditation, five to 15 minutes a day. We're not talking about a lot of time here. So really, as far as I'm concerned, really no excuse to not have a daily practice. Mm -hmm. And by the way, and also um, breathing exercises, you're breathing anyway. <laughs> so let's you know be a little more active uh, in it and you'll actually gain more health benefits from it. As opposed to one of the wonderful new phenomenons that a lot of people are not even ex realizing that they're experiencing is something called internet apnea, which is sitting at your computer and being so ingrained and focused on, focused on this outwardly world that you are paying attention to that you forget to breathe. And there have been studies where people have a pulse ox on while they're just doing the internet and their, their saturations literally drop. Now they're not apneic like sleep apnea. So they, you know, once their body realizes this is happening, they just start breathing, but it's not even noticeable. Their breaths are shallow and they're literally not taking in the amount of oxygen and getting rid of the amount of CO2 that they should be. So if we engage in more of these uh, exercises, then we actually literally will be physically healthier. Wow. So again, really the overall theme here is don't forget about self-care. In fact, you need to make it a, a priority, especially now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this. I guess, I know you said you work with programs and those students, but do you also work with students outside of that? Like if they were yes. to contact yeah. you? <laughs> yes, absolutely. We do one-on-one -on -one, uh, work with, with uh, students and residents. So, and it can be at any any stage of their program. It can be students about to start, it can be students in the program, and we work with a lot of students who are working on preparing for the board, so graduates. Okay. Uh, and, and then of course, we do work with programs. I think you know I, we're in right now with uh, about um, three or four universities, depending on time of year. I'm currently adjunct at uh, Georgetown and University of Wisconsin, uh, but that's with other classes, of course, too. But, but I do throw in the, 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 the health and wellness stuff as well, as, best, as, as much as the program director will allow me. But, uh, but that's how our, this program, the tutoring program started, was one-on-one -on -one and not affiliated with the school, just the students coming to us and saying, hey, I, you know, I could use the, the extra help. And, uh, and that's what makes this program unique is it literally is live one-on-one. -on -one. So we tailor it to the needs of the client. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, I hope you guys uh, remember to download this episode because this is going to be awesome. So if you're going to be years away from school, save this because you want to reach out to Matt when you need him. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but thank you so much, Matt, for joining us today. And you are awesome. And I'm so excited for you to be joining us at our conference. As you guys know, he's having a health and wellness symposium in Austin, Texas on November 5th through November 7th. Check that out. Is there a web, and I'll link to all this in the show notes uh, for the websites and for the link for the breathing tool for you guys to get started in practicing today. So with that, we'll see you guys back next week.
Thanks, Matt. Thank you.